I wonder if you're battling tonight. You in a battle? You fighting? You fighting tonight? I hope you are. I hope you are. Maybe if you're not, maybe we have lost our vision. Maybe we've lost our way. Do you know that there is a real and present battle to be fought, to be had, and to be won in the name of Jesus? I was expecting like a big crescendo trash can coming out here. Got blank stares. I think God brought some of you in this place though, tonight, in this moment, to encounter him in a new way, to be reminded of who he is, what he means in your life and in your journey and in your story. I wonder if the battle <laughs> Has you beaten right now? I wonder if you're willing to rise up and to rally and to continue to fight. Are we done with worship? Okay. Off to a great start here, folks. Can we thank our team? Amen. Corey Miller, the best to ever do it. It just went different in my mind. I was all charged up and woo! No, this is good though. That song, I hope, I hope when you sing that, we could sing that song all day long because the truth is, is that there is nothing, nothing easy sometimes about being human, about following Jesus. And so I think that that's the posture we're coming at this thing from. Who am I? Some guy that just wandered out here, apparently. Uh, my name is Conrad. I am the Littleton Campus Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Scott, you're a legend. I, I don't know what to do with all of this, man. I appreciate it. We, uh, could you take that sharks thing? Off of this stage, though, as you exit, please. Bernard, look at this. This is Shark's territory. We do not set up idols in the house of God. Welcome to Young Adults. Holy cow. All right, wasted, wasted 90 seconds just being confused. I hope you like who you're sitting by. I hope you feel good. Uh, I came um, on purpose tonight. Are you nervous? <laughs> Just me. I am. I am. I've been burdened all week. I think God gave me a word, though, uh, to come and share. He actually gave it to my wife, and then I stole it, hijacked it. That's what she gets for texting me things. She's better anyway. So any gold from tonight, you just, you just give it right back to her. She didn't bother to show up tonight. I'll tell you that much. It's okay. Just her fourth vacation in three weeks. It's okay. Oh, I love this place. I love young adults. I love your pastors. You happy for your pastors? Keaton and Zach holding it down. Connor and Matrone just jet setting wherever they please. Unbelievable. They asked me to preach, and I'm like, thanks, man. I'll, I'll be there. They're like, yeah, we won't, but you're going to do great, buddy. They're two of my best friends in the world. The truth is, is that I haven't known ministry apart from those guys. Um, Connor, I met him on the same day that I met my wife, actually by way of, of his now wife, then girlfriend, uh, attempting to, you know, like pat me, you know, I don't know what she was doing. I don't know what God had in mind for that relationship, but he restored it. They're married. She's my wife's best friend, so I tolerate him by default. Andrew Matrone, what a guy, huh? He doesn't look like much, but I promise you, he's got a heart for hurting people. He's got a heart for our city. He's got a heart for this group and this room. And the truth is, is my wife was actually into, I went to fuel back in the day. Any fuelers? Oh, gee, like, I think that means that we're aging out of the system, if people remember fuel. 
middle-aged young adults, we'll call it. Uh, back in fuel, Andrew was actually there at ground level uh, getting it started. I started going there, uh, man, right out of high school, about summer of 2010 probably. I think if it's that old, that's how long I've been going. It's insane. 50 people maybe in the back of Heritage Square. And uh, he was fighting for people then. I, I just stay attached to this ministry. So I hope that it's something that blesses your heart and your life and your testimony and your story. Because the truth is, a lot of my life looks different. I was at home one day on the couch. I just graduated college. I was a financial analyst dropout. Real ragged. Any financial analysts? Exactly. Exactly. Andrew Zajic, you were a teller, okay? Let's call a spade a spade. And, uh, <laughs> okay. And, and, and so I was confused with life, man. Anybody be confused, like room full of young people? You're like, yes, tell me tonight what I am to do with my future. I don't have that for you. Uh, but, but I was sitting on my couch, my parents' couch in their living room, middle of like a Tuesday. Andrew Matrone shoots me a text message and said, bro, you need to do the internship. He hears on behalf of people, apparently. I still, to this day, don't know if I have a call of God on my life, but I have a text from Andrew Matrone on my iPhone. And so, I, good, good as it gets. That's all I got to work with. Uh, no, I met my wife here, man. My life was just changed here. I've known a lot of people come and go out of this place onto bigger, better things in their lives. God's writing stories in this house. Amen. Amen. Any married people? Amen. All right. You see, there, there have been a lot of matches made, but we all know the intention of the married person. They find them, and they gone. Like, they haven't been back to a Thursday night in years. <laughs> we know. We know. We're in a series. I'm just having fun. I'm settling in. Sorry. We're in a series called New. The new, the new, it's better, the new, and uh, the truth is, is that, man, this whole series is around what it looks like to be made new as a follower of Jesus, made new as a Christian, I was here last week, and Andrew brought fire, man, it was so good, he said, when you are made new, you can now put off the old and pick up the new, you now put to death. The things of your past, you are active in your pursuit of your future. Jesus has more in store for your life. And I'm believing that. Um, I'm praying that over this night, over this message, this ordinary message. It's crazy. The process of writing a message is funny because I don't know anything more than you. I just took a piece of scripture and read it all week before you get a chance to hear it. And so that's just, I went first. But all of this is accessible and available to you. But I just want you to leave here feeling encouraged. I want you to feel spurred on. That's the purpose of the church. You shouldn't come here and be built up. You should be built up and then you should be sent out. Okay? So that's what we're doing here. Um, but, but the reality is, is, we know that this idea, it's easy to stand on a platform and preach, you are a new creation in Christ. Raise your hand, accept Jesus, best decision you ever made, your best days are ahead. Nothing is going to touch you. You got a Mercedes waiting for you in the parking lot. Life is good. Your kids will behave forever. You have a golden retriever and a white picket fence. And can I tell you, that would be amazing, but we are still human, though we are a new creation in Christ. And I think if you're honest with yourself, maybe you have found more seasons of discouragement and disappointment in your story following Jesus than you have felt encouraged, inspired, pushed forward closer to your dreams. And so I want to shed some light on that. You don't need a live podcast tonight. You get plenty of messages. You can have whatever content you want. But we gather here because we believe the Spirit of God rests on this house. And that he's going to do something in your life as a product of it. We have Corey Miller leading worship. Like, I cannot fail right now. Amen. We don't need you to go out of here and have your life wrecked and your life changed and be inspired. And so much so that by the time you hit the McDonald's drive through the word has left your spirit. And French fries are on the way in. And you forget what church was about. I don't know that life. Connor and Andrew talk about it all the time, though. 
They call me the next day, bro, I shouldn't have gone in on that third Big Mac. I'm like, I've been telling you this. <laughs> we need God to move in our hearts. I can't tell if I'm going to preach or if I'm going to teach right now. I'm not sure what we're working with, so I'm just playing the field. Should I get a stool? I could just sit. We can talk. You want to pre- I need to preach because there's some sleepy people, I think, in the room. James chapter 1, I think, speaks to this issue. And if we could walk out of here getting this, I think a lot of things would look different for the new creation in Christ. James chapter 1, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, and sisters, he's a little behind the times, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full, touch your neighbor, say full, full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in Nothing, James outlines a lifelong pursuit of what it looks like to follow Jesus. Tonight I want to talk to you about how do you as a Christian reconcile disappointment? How do you as a Christian confront the test, the trial, the displeasure that might come at the cost of following Jesus? I've titled my message, Trial by Fire. That's good, I know. Say fire. We're going to be going to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. It's an oldie but a goodie. All I've got is God's word tonight. Help me, God. People are like, what angle are you teaching the story from? I said, angle? I said, uh, Jesus? I don't know. I got nothing else. <laughs> so in 14 minutes, we're going to hit the crescendo. We're going to be shouting about Jesus. People are going to feel set free. Are you with me? Daniel chapter 3, the story of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I'm sure you've heard it. You haven't heard it. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the fiery furnace. No Sunday schoolers. This is great because I can make up the whole thing and you have no idea. You got to read your Bible, friends. Let's pray. God, thank you so much. I need to stop rambling. We have a lot to get to. Jesus, would you help me focus? God, no one needs a show. I'm not here to give him a show, God. I believe, though, that you have spoken to me. I believe the enemy is trying to rob us in our life and in our journey and from our joy. And so, God, I pray that you would uplift broken hearts. God, I pray that you would mend disappointed souls. I pray that you would meet with us. That's all we got. What a time to be alive as a Denver sports fan. We just last night took an L. But tonight, tomorrow night, we bounce back in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Some of you guys are like, I came for content. (laughs) Read it yourself then. All right, here we go. You ever been disappointed? Some of you are like, yeah, for the last 11 minutes. (laughs) That's awkward. You ever been disappointed? I feel like these go hand in hand. Any um, endurance athletes? Very similar feeling I have toward both of those things. I was once a swimmer, a swimmer. I know probably because I'm so tall. I was a swimmer. And uh, it was when I was like a little kid and I was on like the neighborhood swim team. Ken Carroll Lightning represent. Yeah, I had like the breezers, the like black shorts. No, you didn't want to be the kid in the Speedo. But like the breezers and the purple lightning all over them, it was amazing. I I was fond of the breaststroke, fellas. (laughs) And uh, and so I I was, sorry, we're going to get to, I swear. But I I was fond of the the breaststroke. I like short distances. I I was not, now I like I'm good to stay afloat on a pool floaty. Okay, but the truth is, is I loved it then. I just didn't want to swim anything over like a 50. You know, that's when it gets tricky. And I didn't love freestyle longer than 25, which is one length of the pool because you had to do a flip turn. Flip turn is a recipe for a nose full of water and your glasses falling off and kicking some lady on the side of the pool when your feet come up. I get signed up one week and I've been training and whatever and swimming. I was like 12 and I get put in the 100 meter freestyle, which is four lengths of the pool. And that is a marathon for a 12-year-old, and I'm like, there is no way, and so I I get up to swim, and I'm trying to think, I'm like, there's no way out of this, except for one, you're right, and so I I intentionally false start, 
I was sure that this would mean that I did not have to swim the rest of the race. I was playing by Olympic rules. Apparently, King Carroll Swim Club honors a different set. And so you actually get two chances. And so I said, fair. Didn't even sell it. Victory lap, cannonball, dipped out, did not have to swim, was proud of myself. I'm like, I wasn't humiliated because I chose that. Show up the next week, 100-meter freestyle again. I'm like, did they not see? It was very apparent what I was trying to do. So I dive in the water because there's no more escape in this. And I hit the first length, and, and, I, and I do. I go full flip turn. I'm like, okay, that's the only way to stay caught up. You don't want to touch and turn. Very slow. Except for I didn't have the knowledge to do that the second time. So I touch the wall, push off. Anyway, I know there's no way I'm finishing in the top three coming back, you know, to 75 meters at this point. And uh, I said, that, okay, um, there's no way out of this. I fake a heart attack in the pool, asthma attack, panic, it didn't matter what kind of attack, I, I fake, I stand up in the shallow end, take my goggles off, say, mom, I have an asthma attack. She said, it's not asthma, it's called swimming, that you can't breathe <laughs> underwater. I wonder if as Christians, sometimes we bow out early because we do not want to endure. I wonder if you look to your left and to your right and see people farther along in their journey, see your setback, see your disappointment, see the world running away, see the fact that you can't keep up. You didn't even want to be in this race in the first place. Someone has put you there. God has put you there. The enemy maybe has put, maybe you chose to be there, but you bow out early. You stand up and say, this fight is not for me. I can't help but think that sometimes this is how we view our faith and our journey. My coaches told me, they said, oh, we were actually just thought it, you're so good at the shorter distances. That's right, I was good. Yeah, Michael Phelps Jr. You were so good at these other distances. We just, we just figured that if you could swim these and keep up and compete, you would be even better and have a greater chance. I wonder if God is using this race that we never wanted to be in to refine something in us, but instead we're allowing our disappointment to distract us from the destiny that he's got on our life, and we're choosing to leave early. Maybe your situation right now is less than ideal. Daniel chapter 3 we get a picture of three fellas named Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah before this King Nebuchadnezzar changes their name. And I do want to make one point that their names were all like God-honoring names. It was about how God helps and Yahweh redeems and you are in the likeness of God. And this king comes in and gives them new names and gives them a new statue and a new idol to worship. How quickly does that happen in our culture? If you don't know who you are, culture will tell you who you are. It will relabel you and it will send you out. And before you know it, you'll just be like, well, this is just who I am. I wonder if you know who you are. But these three guys, could you throw me your water, bro? I'm dying. Yes. You can clap for that. That's great. All right, now we can party. These three guys had chosen early in life not to defile themselves. Meaning they were going to honor the God of heaven no matter what. They were around good people. Hello, good people that could push them in their calling, that could keep them accountable, that could prop them up, that could push them forward. They have resolved not to defile themselves, but King Nebuchadnezzar, he comes from this, this area of Babylon, okay, and he comes into, into the city where they are Jewish people and they're worshiping and he does not honor their gods and contrary to the fact that Someone interprets his dream and say, you're going to set up a golden statue and it's going to completely shatter and your world is going to collapse. And he's like, okay, cool. The next chapter, he is setting up this golden statue that is set for certain collapse. You've got to read this for yourself because it's so good. It's so indicative of the human mind and how we work. One minute, faith filled. The next minute, forgetful. And we just don't know what to do with our faith, but so there's these guys, and, and all of a sudden there's this 90-foot golden statue, and it says this, uh, Daniel chapter 3, verse 4, 
And everyone, the herald proclaimed aloud, you are commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, love me some good trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Pretty straightforward. And this message goes viral because ain't nobody want to go to the fiery furnace. Okay, and so everyone, as the sound of music, will bow. This sounds a little bit like how things get spread through our world today in a much more discreet kind of way. The next documentary that has this line of thought, what do you think about I don't know, but Netflix made a thing, and so I'm in. Like, everyone else is, so like, I have, I have no choice. No choice but to watch Game of Thrones, because it's just what it's on. And this is how things spread in our culture. All of a sudden, these God-honoring people are bowing to an idol in a moment. I wonder how fast we get robbed of our destiny, of our focus in a moment. Daniel chapter 12, these guys had already resolved not to defile themselves. It says there are certain Jews, so someone comes, sorry, someone comes to the king, a tattletale, if you will, and he's a little jealous because these guys actually were esteemed in the king's courts, although they were honoring another god. They got put there actually because they were honoring the god of heaven, and he's like, this is amazing. Then he makes the golden statue. But these people come. To the king, and they say, there are certain Jews, I'm not going to name names, but you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon. Actually, their names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These guys are against the grain. So Nebi doubles down, okay? He says, all right. I like these guys. These are some of my people. And so he brings them in. He goes, let me clear this up. And he plainly spells it out. And he goes, okay, are you ready? Like, are you ready? You're going to hear the trot. Don't forget the trigon. You bow. You bow when you hear the trigon. And he says this. Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of all those instruments, you will bow. Everything will be well and good. Sorry, pro presenter people. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Let me reiterate. And then he says, and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Who is the God? So you already know. You already know, Nebuchadnezzar. So short-sighted. And then the boys, they, they fire back. And I believe only two of them were actually thinking this. The third one was probably a little more hesitant, but... He's in on it anyway. So he says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. I'm going to switch a rule over to the message version because I love how it reads. It says, your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up, O king, like, oh, buddy boy. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you set up. But even if not, Eugene Peterson, I love it. He's got some sass. He's got some tone when he writes this paraphrase of scripture. It says, we have no need to answer to you first and foremost. He said, we already know who we answer to. Christian, I wonder, I wonder, lean into this. Have you been fighting the wrong fight? Have you been standing up for yourself when only God can? Have you been trying to defend your position when you have no need to answer to the threat of the enemy? You have no need it's Jesus. You know who didn't defend himself when he hung up on a cross at Calvary 2,000 years ago? Jesus. His battle was won. He had no need to defend himself because he was serving the God of heaven. He says, our God is able and he will. I could punch this guy because of the confidence. Right? 
we sing songs like, you're never going to let me down. That song is so hard on my heart. Can we be honest in church? Never? Like, never. I wonder if you lack confidence. I wonder if you trust him. I wonder if you trust him to say, even if he doesn't. I wonder if you trust him even enough to say he will. And your naivety, which good for you, maybe you are new to faith and you have seen God come through because he does. I believe all of it. Your best days are ahead. I believe God heals. I believe God saves, restores, redeems, delivers. I believe it in its entirety because I've seen it in my life. But we are still subjected to a broken world, are we not? I love this. It says, but even if he doesn't, three considerations of the new creation in Christ. See what I did there? Nobody sees. <laughs> three considerations of the new creation. Number one, your confession cannot be contingent on conditions. But even if he does, and it says it makes no difference for me. It makes no difference in my soul, he says, because I'm actually good. He says, I can see beyond the superficial of my circumstance, and I can see a God who reigns eternal and reigns supreme and reigns without end, even if he does it. He can. I'm sure he will. But what if he doesn't? What's the condition of your soul, young adult? Have you been made new long enough <laughs> To realize that disappointment is a very present, possible reality. Are you in a place of trust? Even if he doesn't heal that sickness, that that person in your life, you say, okay, I believe this stuff. They say you got to have faith or it won't happen. Not true, by the way. I hate when people say that. You didn't have enough faith. Not true. It's just that we serve a God that sometimes it's but even if he doesn't. Do you have faith even, even if he doesn't give that promotion? You've served. You fought hard. You've been honoring. You've put in the time, the hours. You've been praying. You say, one day I will finally have a position where I can bring the gospel into my workplace. And it's going to be awesome. And I'm going to send an email to everyone on the chain. But even if he doesn't, I'm going to worship in my cubicle. And I'm going to tell the three people around me that God's good. But even if he doesn't. Deliver me out of this miserable situation. But even if he doesn't bring that spouse into my life, although I have been praying and I've been dating honorably and I've been doing everything I can, even if he doesn't, I will worship. Even if he doesn't, I don't need to answer or bow or praise the things of the world because I have one focus and one attention and one object of my affection, and that is Jesus resurrected forever. Amen. Even if he doesn't, will you throw in the towel? The temptation is always going to be to bow out. I wonder, will you change your confession? Will your conviction shift? Will you change your belief? I know some people that used to come in this room full of faith, had groups, would share the gospel, would pass it out on subways. Some hard times hit their life, and because their confession was contingent on the culture around them, was contingent on the things going on around them, they stepped away completely. Now what do they have to anchor their soul to? I do not know. This is it. It's all we've got. What is your confession, and are you confident? And I think millennials, we sometimes want a God that does and give up and bow out when he doesn't. I had this even if he doesn't moment one time. I had a question mark by this story. We're in too deep. My wife's mom was, uh, she fought cancer for seven years. And when we started dating, I stepped in right in the middle when it was getting the work. She got better for a long time. God was doing miracles. She was off treatment, the whole thing. And the whole time we were dating, it got worse and worse and worse until, <clears throat> until she finally, she, she breathed her last two, three weeks before our wedding. 
This stuff is fun to preach, but what about to live? This is our story, Christian. Even if he doesn't, I don't know if I could have said that. I didn't believe that. Even if he doesn't, you kidding me? How am I supposed to call him healer? How am I supposed to call him friend? How am I supposed to call him savior? Because we lose sight. We lose sight of the greater picture of eternity. We lose sight of the greatest gift. Even if he doesn't, now my family friend, basically my uncle, is going through the same exact thing. And I have a perspective because I walk through a fire. And I say, even if he doesn't, I know where my faith is. I know where my confession stands. The truth is, is that the world does not need candy-coated Christians. It doesn't need it. It doesn't need the Instagram Photoshop perfectly lit Christian to walk into the world like sunshine and rainbows. It needs some Christians who rolled up their sleeves, battled hard, and had the opportunity to worship even if he did it. The cost of the confession is expensive, friend, but it is the only thing you have to anchor your soul to or you toss to and fro by the wind, even if he doesn't. Verse 19. Yep, that's the wrong chapter. Here we go. Verse 19. So Nebuchadnezzar, he gets really irritated, right? Filled with fury. Okay, and the expression of his face was changed. It was angry to angrier. Against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. He says, tie them up. Put them in. He said they refuse to bow. They've got this even if he doesn't weird mentality. He said seven times hotter, seven times the biblical number of completion and perfection, meaning it was all the way up. Okay, and so they're about, or (laughs) the perfected Jesus had an opportunity to do an incredible miracle. What's your lens? I don't know. That's free. The three men fell bound into the furnace. They did everything right. They served God. They honored God. They had resolved not to defile themselves, yet they find themselves bound, shackled in the furnace. Maybe this is you. I have done everything I can to serve, follow, obey, take steps of faith, take simple steps of obedience, honor God with my body, my time, my resources. And I am in this fire They refused to bow. Is this your season? God, I have done everything. And you have fallen into the fire of despair and doubt and insecurity. And God is saying to you, he says, it's not over. It's not over. You're bound and you have fallen in. Number two, the second confession of the Christian, or whatever I called it before, we got that, says this, disappointment does not decide dictate or derail your destiny it does not decide dictate or derail your destiny it might delay it it might redirect it but only Jesus has a say over where you end up only Jesus has the final say of your story only Jesus gets to determine whether or not you are going to make it to a or b all you can do is decide within yourself and resolve to follow him you believe that I don't know if you believe that. Some of you are right now, right now, some of you are like, not true, bro. Disappointment has had me hostage for a long time, and it's decided and dictated everything about my life. I think you need a perspective change. I think right here, God needs to speak to you. I called this message trial by fire. You see, I I didn't really know what it meant. Like, you hear it, we throw it around all the time. Did you know that? So it's an idiom, idiomatic expression, grammarist.com, hooking it up tonight. Shout out to our sponsors. 
It says this, in the Middle Ages, when the judicial process failed to decide the guilt or innocence of a person accused of a crime, either due to conflicting witnesses, lack of evidence, or some other reason that the jury failed to come to a verdict on, he was subjected to a trial by ordeal, one being a trial by fire where the accused was either forced to snatch an object out of a fire or forced to walk over hot coals. Again, if the person showed no sign of burns after a few days, he was innocent. Nowadays, we use it a situation in which participants' abilities and determination are tested. A trial by fire is a test of one's ability to function under pressure, and the implication is that once one successfully survives a trial by fire, he has proved his mastery. Meaning, your ability to stay focused on the cross in your trial, when you are in the fire, when you are bound, hands tied, not sure what to do, will be dictated. You will be tested in this trial by fire. Meaning, your determination to link yourself to the word, the truth, the convictions of the Holy Spirit, and to remain will determine where you end up. It says if they were not burned, they were innocent. Guess who was not burned and who was innocent? Our three amigos in the fire. It says you will have proven mastery. The problem, the problem with proven mastery is that this is a process, a lifelong process that fancy church people like to call sanctification. And it never stops. And your journey on this side of eternity will be through a series of trial by fire moments. But you have your hope and your heart attached and linked to heaven. And so you can make it out unscathed. Some of you, instead of being delivered from the fire, you feel like God delivered you to the fire. Make no mistake, Nebuchadnezzar delivered them to the fire, but Jesus, we will see, will sustain, strengthen, and remain with them through the fire. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to him, true, O king. He answered and said, but I see I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. We could argue all day about whether this Christophany is the actual image of Jesus in their fire, but you can take it down to Denver Seminary because I know they serve one true God who had one son that he gave on a cross on our behalf, and there's a fourth person in the fire that looks like a son of the gods. So I'm believing that it was Jesus. That was the moment. You missed it. Nope. Uh-uh. There's Jesus. In this moment, walking in the fire, and I love it. They fell bound, shackled into the fire. They stand unbound, free, risen up when Jesus encounters the story. I wonder if Jesus was present the whole time, but it took the fire to really illuminate his presence in their situation. I wonder if some of you are in a fire and Jesus is just saying, just wait. I'm in. They didn't know they were going to get delivered from the fire. They're standing, knocking on the door, throwing it. They're like, it surely is going to happen now. The guys open it, getting burned. Like, and they're all of a sudden in it. Jesus said, had you not gone through the fire, I would not have been able to do a miracle. I would not have been able to show you how much faith is possible. I think these guys... And I hesitate to say this. I think they needed the fire. I wonder if they needed the fire, not that God put them there or created it or caused it, but to see the miraculous, healing, profound power of Jesus Christ. He said, just wait a little bit longer in the fire. Are you awake still? Do I have you? Anybody encouraged? Anybody encouraged? Jesus And I love this. Before Jesus comes on the scene to save uh, all of humanity, he shows up for the individual. He shows up for the three. This just reminds me that in my story, in my life, while I will declare all day Jesus is for everybody, but he's for me and my fire. He'll meet me when it's not convenient. 
Is it possible that Jesus was there the whole time just waiting on a fire that he knew they needed? The problem is we hate the process. We hate the fire. Bunch of Christians, we hate the fire. We want the golden retriever. I got to wrap this up. Man, come on out here. Get me off this stage. I heard on the radio, who listens to radio? I don't know. It was, no, it was about, <laughs> you could cheer for radio, but I heard on the radio on accident, apparently, Facebook has had a face. Do you remember Facebook? Anybody remember? Some of you are like, what's wrong with Facebook? Facebook added a new feature called Secret Crush. You're way too excited about Secret Crush. This is so indicative of the condition of our humanity right now in 2019. We can't even go and download a dating app anymore. We got to blindly search around 8 billion people on Facebook, clicking, searching, looking, hoping that somebody stumbled across us and will hit that secret like button back so that we could be matched, live happily ever ever after, have a house, a dog. We hate the process. We hate the fire. Maybe God's saying to you, would you remain? Would you be refined? Would you let my process do its work? But we got to push it. We have to push our timeline, our agenda. And I think God is saying to some of us, I am trying to bring gold out of your story. I'm trying to do something in your life. Number three, to reconcile disappointment resolve to reconcile, recognize refinement. To reconcile disappointment, resolve to recognize refinement. Disappointment will come your way, but as a Christian, you have a lens of life to look at it from. You have a lens to say, Actually, I know because I read the word of God and it's deep in my heart that he doesn't waste anything, that he takes all things that were meant, that were formed for evil in my life and he gives it an opportunity to breathe life on it and use it to not only benefit me but to benefit some people around me. Do you recognize refinement in your life? Anybody ever go on the field trip where you used to pan for gold? Amazing. Best day of the year. Where did you go? You went and you like stuck your little bucket thing in mud and muck and disgusting, right? This is how gold miners, gold panners used to do it. First, you'd have to find it in the dirt, in the mess. Can I say, Christian, this is right where Jesus has already found you, in the mess. But you know that that gold is not usable. It must be washed. Then it must be crushed to separate it from the things that are weighing it down, from the things that are impure. And then it goes through the firing process. And as Christians, we stole it, call it the refiner's fire, but it's burned at such a high heat in order to remove the waste, remove the impurities, to melt it down, to make it new, to start something opportunistic through it. It's unusable before the fire. No one wants a gold ring that's half of like a rock in, that fell from a tree. Like no one, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Jesus has this refinement process on our life. And he's saying it's going to take some work. It's going to take a process. It's going to take a journey. It's going to take some crushing. And it's going to take some moments where you stand through the fire. be formed into something brand new. Wildfires are devastating. They are tragic. But on the other side, you see new life spring up. No one wants to have a wildfire, but everyone gets excited about the newness coming through the earth. First Peter 1, 6. In this, you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes. Our faith perishes. Though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Are you having trouble reconciling disappointment? 
Maybe you're just in refinement. The story closes with this. Verse 27, gather together. The king calls everyone, gathers them together. And he saw that the fire had not had any power over the body of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their cloaks were not harmed. And no smell of fire had come upon them. The fire might be the process, but it is not the power. Can I tell you that? Would you stand to your feet? Would you stand to your feet? The fire is the process, but it's not the power. Let this be an encouragement. They were not singed. They were not affected. They were delivered out the other side, but they had to go through the process. They had to be affected by it. I wonder if disappointment has left you discouraged. And I just want to speak life to close this message. You will not leave your season, your situation with the aroma of what you have been through. Jesus' power is too great for that. Just because you came from a separated home does not mean that your home will fail, that your family will be divided. Just because you've been struggling in and out of alcoholism does not mean you're going to be an alcoholic. Just because your father was absent in your life and you were burned does not mean you are sentenced to being a deadbeat dad. Just because you've struggled with something in the past and you put it to death here on this stage last week and you came back into it again does not mean this is the pattern for your life. Church, bitterness, no more. You are not burned by the church because Jesus has done too much. You're giving him another chance. Don't let people get in the way of that. Your story is being made new. It's being rewritten. It's being restored. It's being redeemed. God brought me here in this moment just to tell you that it's not over. Maybe you're disappointed. You're discouraged. God's lifting your head and saying, there's more ahead of you. Nebuchadnezzar, he fell down and he began to worship the God of heaven like he had done before, but he had lost his way because he is the one that saw Jesus in the fire with these men. Your disappointment can no longer hold you down because some other people need you to move past it so they can see the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ on your life. God, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for this team. I thank you for this ministry. God, I pray over any single person in here that is discouraged, that are letting circumstance devalue their season. God, I pray that it be gone in the name of Jesus. I pray that you would lift our eyes back to you. God, I'm thankful for your word. I pray that you would illuminate it in the hearts of my friends here in this space. God, your power is too great. Your power is too great to leave us this way as we walk through the fire, God. Would you be near? Would we identify you as if for the first time? Would we learn to trust you and love you in our situation? Have no more stronghold over our confession of faith. I just can't get off the stage without an opportunity at least to extend to someone in this place that has no anchor for their soul, that has no one in the fire with them or they have yet to realize it. Could I tell you that in your biggest season of doubt, your biggest season of depression and fear and worry and insecurity, there was a God who knew you and that was standing and I hope in this moment he would take you back and he would be illuminated in those memories that have held you down and that abuse that keeps replaying in your head. Maybe you have never said, Jesus, I need you. God, I'm sick of my fire being in vain. I want you to give it purpose. If you're in here tonight and you need Jesus, the Savior, the Son of Man, to step into your life in a real and a personal way, would you just slip your hand up right now? Jesus name. Yes, Jesus. Maybe you've been in a season of significant disappointment. I just want to I just want to pray over this room. If you have disappointment and you feel like it's derailed your entire destiny, your story, could you lift a hand? 
everybody, a whole bunch of us at some point. God, I thank you that you meet us where we're at. God, I pray over these people in the middle of their disappointment, in the middle of their regret, their fear, their discouragement. Jesus, would you just show them the picture that what's ahead is greater than what's behind. Come and meet with us in Jesus' name. Amen.